announcements. Uh, any... I guess not. Yes, Carol. All right. Who are the two good people? We will also probably have um, one more session on Ukraine before the end of the semester, this time on emerging technology in the Ukrainian war. So I know a lot of the grad students here have interests in emerging technology. So if you have any ideas, I'll probably get Eric Lynn Greenberg to manage that one. Yeah, there's. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the MIT Security Studies Program Wednesday uh, seminar. Today, we're um, fortunate to have Professor uh, Lamy Kim here, who's talking about uh, everything but the bomb, South Korea's nuclear hedging strategy. Uh, Professor uh, Kim is uh, in security studies at the Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies under the U.S. Department of Defense. She's also a member of the mid-career nuclear cadre at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a non-resident scholar at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, and adjunct fellow at Pacific Forum. Until recently, uh, she served as associate professor and director of the Asian Studies Program at the U.S. Army War College. Uh, her research focuses on the intersection between international security and technologies, including nuclear and emerging technologies and security issues in East Asia. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor. 
Well, well, thank you very much for your introduction, and thank you everyone for coming. I was actually very excited to come here to join MIT as a Stanton Nuclear Fellow this year, but I uh, couldn't join MIT because I had to move to Hawaii, which is not a bad place either. Um, um, so, and I'm very happy to uh, be here to talk about my book project. The so title of the book sort of gives it away. Um, I'm going to discuss South Korea's nuclear hedging strategy. Um, but before I begin, I should mention that I speak for myself, not for the U.S. Department of Defense or the U.S. government. So to give you my, my arguments up front, I argue that South Korea is pursuing nuclear hedging strategy, which means retaining an option for future nuclear weapons acquisition instead of nuclear armament because acquiring nuclear weapons is very costly. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this concept, nuclear hedging is similar to nuclear latency, which is the ability to acquire nuclear weapons quickly with the intent to build nuclear weapons if need be in the future. And South Korea has sophisticated nuclear expertise acquired through a civilian nuclear program, and also it has advanced dual capable delivery mechanisms, delivery systems that can carry nuclear weapons but it lacks the ability to produce nuclear fissile materials, which is the biggest hurdle to acquiring nuclear weapons. And so South Korea is pursuing this tech capability through both civilian and military programs. So in my presentation, I'll briefly talk about South Korea's um, march toward nuclear weapons in the 70s under President Park Chung-hee. And then I will discuss some recent calls for nuclear weapons and examine whether South Korea will try to get nuclear weapons, uh, but I would argue that instead of nuclear weapons, South Korea will pursue nuclear latency with the ambition to build nuclear weapons in mid, mid be in the future. And uh, I will briefly discuss South Korea's nuclear delivery vehicles and then I'll examine whether it really takes South Korea, it, it really takes nuclear weapons for South Korea to deter North Korea's nuclear weapons. And then I'll, I'll conclude with some policy uh, discussions. So uh, in um, the early 1970s, South Korea pursued nuclear weapons. It launched the Covert Nuclear Weapons Program in 1973. Amid a pre precarious security environment, North Korea was becoming more bold and assertive. For example, in 1969,
editorial board, um, which was released right after the Washington Declaration, uh, which said uh, the de this declaration seems to put more emphasis on American concerns about South Korea's going nuclear than on North Korea's nuclear threats. And South Korea must be in a position to defend itself. So uh, the prospect uh, uh, for the Washington Declaration alleviating South Korea's concerns, I think it's not that. Another reason why I think the South Korea's nuclear ambition will persist is because there are some other reasons uh, why South Koreans want nuclear weapons, according to the Chicago survey, again, that I, I con conducted with my colleagues. Uh, surprisingly, we found that 39% of people said that they want nuclear weapons because of threats other than North Korea. In another question, we asked like which, which countries will be the biggest threat to South Korea in 10 years and over 50%, 55% said uh, China. So uh, assuming from that, we can kind of assume, speculate that uh, at least partially, China's um, increasing assertiveness is one, at least a partial uh, reason behind South Korea's uh, call for nuclear uh, weapons. And also, prestige was also an important factor, 26% of prestige, and only 10% um, picked uh, the skepticism toward nuclear, uh, the U.S.'s security guarantee as the reason. So, if of course, this is one data point. We need more investigation into this. Uh, however, if this is correct, then the Washington's uh, Washington's efforts to alleviate South Korea will not address, I mean, uh, not, not make South Korea's call for nuclear weapons disappear. However, nonetheless, I don't really think that South Korea will acquire nuclear weapons because it is just simply too costly. Um, first, the U.S. may withdraw its secu security guarantee. When pa President Park jong hee gave up uh, his nuclear weapons program, the U.S. threatened to withdraw a security guarantee, and that um, led Park jong hee to close the, the program. And the U.S. may um, still, uh, you, you, the U.S. Uh, may try to do that again. Although this is debatable, we can talk about this during Q&A if you want, because I hear uh, that increasingly more American people are uh, becoming support, not, not supportive, but acceptive of um, um, and more tolerant toward the idea of a nuclear Korea. Um, but there is a risk that actually acquiring nuclear weapons will undermine South Korea, South Korea's security is, if, no, if the U.S.'s security guarantee was withdrawn, um, um, especially during the period that South Korea uh, 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 tries to acquire workable nuclear weapons, which will take some time. Some say three to five years and others say shorter than that, but yeah. Um, and also, economic costs will be really, uh, really high. Uh, there could be international UN Security Council level sanctions, um, and Chinese sanctions alone will be really destructive to South Korea's economy. It's heavily dependent on uh, exports, and uh, the South Korea's nuclear fuel supply will be dis disrupted. And also, reputational costs will be high. South Korea will. Uh, fall from a soft power, uh, uh, emerging soft power powerhouse to a nuclear uh, international pariah. So this are, this will be very costly, and therefore the, a more rational choice for South Korea would be nuclear hedging. Um, and the the uh, acquiring the ability to acquire, um, develop nuclear weapons in short order if it decides to do so in the future. And South Korea has a pretty significant nuclear technology. It has sophisticated nuclear energy program that it built after renouncing its nuclear weapons program based on assistance that it received from the United States and Canada. And now South Korea has emerged as the fifth largest nuclear energy producer after the US, China, France, and Russia. And also it's a rising nuclear vendor. Recently, China, South Korea completed the construction of four nuclear power plants in the UAE, and it is competing with China, Russia, and the United States uh, and France in the global nuclear market. However, South Korea lacks the capability to produce nuclear fissile materials to enrichment and reprocessing. It has the know-how to do, 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 do that. Everybody believes that South Korea will be able to do that. However, under the um, bilateral nuclear cooperation pro, uh, agreement with the United States, so-called one to 3 agreement, South Korea is prohibited uh, from doing so. But South Korea is trying to acquire those technologies. 
uh, through the civilian nuclear program. South Korea has been arguing that it needs enrichment and then pyroprocessing, a kind of reprocessing uh, technologies for its civilian program, the enrichment for its fuel production, uh, because South Korea needs enriched uranium to run as nuclear power plants, and uh, pyroprocessing for spent fuel management. Um, so, and developing these technologies is not illegal under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Some say that that is a loophole in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Others say that that was the only thing that they could agree upon. Um, but anyways, it is not illegal as long as South Korea places uh, international monitoring safeguards, IAEA safeguards, um, <clears throat> on, on those facilities. However, under the one to 3 agreement, um, South Korea needs the U.S.'s consent uh, before doing this. Um, so the two countries renegotiated the treaty back in 19, uh, uh, 2015 after like about six years of negotiations. And finally, Washington sort of opened the possibility of South Korea's enrichment to 20%. However, um, so, I mean, South Korea demanded this for a long time and the U.S. said, okay, we can talk about it more. And potentially you can do this up to 20%. But since then, that was already uh, eight years ago, there hasn't been much progress. And then um, because the from the U.S.'s perspective, um, the, that rationale that South Korea uses is not very convincing because in rich uranium, uh, there has no, not been any uh, disruption in, in, in the international supply of enriched uranium. Uh, and so why do you want to build your own enrichment capabilities? And private processing, well, that is not really going anywhere. Other countries, the UK and the US, have also tried to develop the technology, but it was just really not going anywhere. And so the rationale is pretty weak. And South Korea is taking another route uh, to pursue enrichment now with the nuclear-powered submarine program. Um, <clears throat> South Korea's argument is that North Korea has the ability to launch nuclear weapons from, the, from submarines, and South Korea also needs submarines, nuclear-powered submarines uh, that can submerge, stay underwater for an extended period of time um, in order to counter North Korea's SLBM threats. And the non-proliferation treaty is actually si uh, silent on the non-explosive um, use of nuclear technologies to benefit us for military, military purposes. And therefore, IAEA safeguards are not even required. And so potentially, if South Korea acquires enrichment capabilities for its re naval reactor, then AI IAEA won't be able to monitor what South Korea does with this fissile materials from uh, the naval reactor. And so the one to three agreement when it comes to military, but milit when it comes to military use of nuclear technologies, including nuclear power submarines, the one to three agreement strictly prohibits South Korea's uh, enrichment re reprocessing. And also from the U.S.'s perspective of strategic rationale is pretty questionable because unlike the unlike the AUKUS deal, unlike Australia, which has to roam around the, the vast Indian Ocean, South Korea's main adversary is right in above the, it's uh, north of its country and then the, the ocean. I mean, so South Korea already has pretty advanced diesel powered nuclear uh, diesel power submarines that can stay underwater up to for up to 50 days and does South Korea need more than that and also when it comes to um, like um, I mean, uh, um, the diesel power submarines are actually quieter and so they are in a way less vulnerable to detect the de detection and nuclear power submarines are very expensive and that's why uh, some American policymakers think that while well, South Korea is pursuing this for hedging, nuclear hedging purposes. But South Korea has been seeking to revise the one to three agreement. This is an ongoing thing. Um, but this can, so, but I'm not saying that this enrichment reprocessing for uh, South Korea's civil and military pro uh, programs won't be any of any value at all that could be helpful. However, um, if they but, but if they develop them, um, um, this technology would also satisfy South Korea's ambition to go nuclear quickly. And once South Korea acquires nuclear fissile materials or nuclear weapons, South Korea will be prepared to deliver them. 
uh, because South Korea has uh, very advanced nuclear, advanced dual capable delivery mechanisms. As some scholars have pointed out, uh, having nuclear capable delivery mechanisms significantly shortens the nuclear weaponization process and thus uh, narrow the window of, of opportunity. So it is a good hedging, a nuclear hedging um, uh, measure. And I argue that actually South Korea has a nuclear triad, the potential to have nuclear triad, although it doesn't have nuclear weapons. South Korea has developed advanced uh, short intermediate range uh, ballistic missiles, uh, uh, the ground based the ground launch uh, ballistic missiles, uh, and even the capability to develop solid fueled intercontinental ballistic missile. The, the picture on the bottom right uh, is a picture taken uh, from uh, South Korea's launch of uh, space rocket uh, last year, in December last year. And then that test actually in, uh, indicates that South Korea could actually build ICBM, uh, solar field ICBM. And South Korea is the only non-nuclear weapon state that has the capability to launch nuclear weapons from uh, underwater, from submarine. Uh, South Korea tested SLBMs um, a couple of times um, already. And then also the picture on the uh, 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 the picture of the fighter uh, that is a KKF twenty one Burame. 4.5 generation um, brand new fighter uh, which can carry nuclear weapons. Um, South Korea doesn't have strategic bombers, but it is not difficult to redesign these fighters to, to deliver nuclear weapons. Um, so, 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 uh, so far I have argued that South Korea has sophisticated nuclear technologies and delivery mechanisms. And so once it acquires nuclear weapons, it will be able to uh, develop a workable nuclear arsenal pretty quickly. And South Korea is pursuing the fissile materials in order to be able to build nuclear weapons quickly. But uh, some argue that South Korea actually may not need nuclear weapons in order to deter North Korea as nuclear threats. And in fact, South Korea has a conventional deterrence strategy. Um, it's three-pronged strategy, including uh, consists of a uh, first kill chain. Um, the kill chain is a a strategy to preemptively attack North Korea's nuclear and missile sites if it becomes if um, North Korea's attack against South Korea is imminent. Uh, it is a counter force um, uh, strike, uh, and then if South Korea cannot get rid of all the missiles and nuclear weapons of North Korea, then the whatever will come from North Korea will be uh, intercepted by. The, the goal is to intercept them. Uh, by KAMD, Korean Aerial Missile Defense. And then after South Korea is attacked first, then um, South Korea will retaliate against North Korea. It's a counter value strike against the people and the leadership, the KMPR, Korean Massive um, uh, Retaliation, Punishment and Retaliation. Um, so some argue that South Korea really has uh, advanced conventional capabilities far superior to South and North Korea's conventional capabilities. And with the development of conventional technologies these days in South Korea, we'll be able to deter North Korea with North Korea with its conventional capabilities. But I, I think that I argue that uh, actually the deterrent keep effectiveness of this uh, the conventional deterrence strategy is questionable. First of all, for kill chain, in order for kill chain to work, South Korea will be able to detect and strike in North Korea's nuclear arsenal, arsenal, which will be really hard, especially when North Korea has the ability to launch those from submarines and it has, um, and, and so North Korea can hide them. And then of course, South Korea doesn't know where all North Korea's assets are to begin with, and then they are moving. And missile defense, uh, there are a lot of skeptics of missile defense. I, I know that Professor Postal here at MIT is also very skeptical. But even if missile defense works you know, normally pretty well, uh, still missile defense can shoot down only so many missiles as Hamas's recent attack against Israel shows. Uh, just just uh, Israel's very advanced, very impressive Iron Dome missile defense system was just overwhelmed by just the sheer number of missiles that Hamas fired at, at Israel. And given the fact that North Korea's missiles are so much more sophisticated, 
uh, then Hamas is missiles. So I, I, I'm skeptical about uh, the missile defense, the, the, the deterrence by denial strategy. And I, I believe that the counter strike, uh, counter value strike, uh, the, 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 especially uh, the decapitation strategy has the highest chance of deterrence by punishment um, because uh, the North Korea center of gravity is the leadership. And if Kim Jong un believes that South Korea will be able to you know, remove Kim Jong un, strike uh, Kim Jong un, and uh, the North Korean elites were about. Uh, then this deterrent, uh, deterrence will, be, will work. However, South Korea will never really be sure if Kim Jong-un will believe that, that, that capability. And so uh, I argue that um, South Korea will not be satisfied with its conventional deterrence capability strategy and pursue nuclear hedging. So lastly, then, um, then what does this mean for Washington? What should Washington do if South Korea's call for nuclear arm armament persists, and then if and, and if South Korea continues to pursue nuclear hedging strategy? So a lot of people, when they talk about this as a you know policy recommendation, they say, oh, enhance the the credibility of extended deterrence, but how do you really do that? And uh, you have to really think uh, very serious about whether just enhancing nuclear extended deterrence will uh, fundamentally address South Korea's sense of insecurity. And because the U.S. has been doing a lot for South Korea, and then South Korea's sense of insecurity is not really disappearing. And also some argue that what about then redeploying, what about redeploying U.S.'s tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea? Well, I think that this is not really going to solve the problem either. I think it is actually the, wor uh, the worst of both worlds uh, in the sense that South Korea still not have access to the authority to use nuclear weapons. Um, but uh, the, those tactical nuclear weapons uh, in, in South Korea will be become the first target if something happens. Um, and so, I, and then also, even if the U.S. deploys nuclear weapons in South Korea, I don't really think that South Korea will be will be then just happen like okay, we we feel pretty good now. I don't think so. <clears throat> and then the question is whether Washington should support or at least condone South Korea's nuclear armament or at least nuclear latency or nuclear hedging. We can talk more about this, and I actually want to hear your thoughts on this as well. Uh, but um, yeah. So I will just conclude uh, by uh, briefly talking about some contributions that this book project will uh, hopefully make to the nuclear proliferation literature. Uh, this project touches upon a lot of subtopics of the nuclear uh, nuclear studies, including nuclear export controls, uh, extended deterrence, deterrence, and et cetera. And I, I, I hope that this book will be a good case study for all those uh, 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 topics. And also it contributes to Korean studies. So when it comes to like these issues, nuclear issues uh, in Korea, uh, in Korean studies, mostly most scholars focus on North Korea's nuclear threats and North Korea's missiles, um, but uh, not not much attention has been paid to South Korea's nuclear capabilities or conventional capabilities either. And also when we talk about nuclear, South Korea's nuclear option, we normally talk about it in a binary fashion, either have them or not have them. But there is a third option, which is nuclear hedging. Uh, and South Korea's nuclear armament, or even nuclear latency, uh, will have significant implications. Um, um, even if South Korea doesn't build nuclear weapons, of course, if South Korea builds nuclear weapons, the, the consequences will be even more dire uh, because you know it's almost axiomatic, you know, uh, that Japan will follow suit, and then the security environment um, in Northeast Asia will become even more volatile with Chinese protests and North Korea's uh, uh, protests also. Uh, but even uh, South Korea's nuclear latency will destabilize the global. Uh, undermine the global nuclear non-proliferation norms because then there are some other nuclear aspirants, well, Saudi Arabia and some other countries uh, come to my mind, uh, that they will also try to um, follow suit and by uh, developing enrichment and reprocessing. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to give uh, priority first questions for our staff fellows. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I have a question about the causes of the consistent public support for nuclear armament. Um, 
Uh, how, do you think, how much do you, you think? Stand up, James. Okay. So better. Um, how much do you think the um, information of that imbalance between elites and public play a role, uh, specifically about the co potential cause of nuclear armament? And I, I know you told us about um, going independent, building independent nuclear arsenal would be very costly. We check all the But I wonder how much um, when you're conducting the surveys. And I know there are some some research that shows if you tell them about the potential cause of nuclear armament, then that totally changes the, the responses of the public, South Korean public. So um, do you think the public knows about those potential causes and still prefers the nuclear weapons, or is it um, do, they don't have good knowledge of the cause compared to the elites, and that's the reason? Um, and if EPS, why is it that elites like, intentionally you know, preventing the public know the actual cause of nuclear armament to gain some leverage in their negotiation with Washington. Um, I think that will also have a policy implication for Washington because one one option for Washington would be making clear statement that like warning about the cause of going nuclear to South Koreans, um, that they will stop their not just in increasing the credibility of alliance, but also about telling the people about what they're gonna do when South Korea will leave those nuclear weapons. So. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. So actually, when my colleague is talking about this, I thought... Do we need to address the small guest party? Yes, she has my question. So yeah, when we actually decided to conduct this survey, uh, our hypothesis was that actually when people uh, learn about the cost of the government, they would change their opinion. Because we're very unsatisfied with the, the, the surveys that are out there that just uh, ask one single question, do you support South Korean nuclear weapons or not? And so we, we thought that that's not a very good uh, way to do it. And so we actually asked the question first, do you support it or not? And then, uh, you know, uh, gave the follow-up questions like, what oh, do you think that what, well, uh, the United States would draw, would draw the security guarantee if South Korea was nuclear? And do you think that China will do sanctions? And do you think that North Korea will really not give up? I mean, the South Korea's going nuclear will, will um, and um, any efforts um, uh, for North Korea's to 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 continue to continue to uh, But actually, and so we we asked those questions in order to make them understand that these are the costs of going nuclear. But actually, surprisingly, only eleven percent um, changed their opinion after uh, being informed of those uh, potential consequences. So that was a, a, a really big surprise. However, recently there was a, another survey uh, conducted by Kinyo Korea Institute of National Unification uh, that actually found um, different results. Actually, a significant number of people changed their minds. And so the, the support for nuclear weapons dropped by, by like 30% to 30 something percent, So that is pretty significant. When we try, try to just reconcile all this, you know. Uh, this 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 connect and so uh, we uh, we are gonna uh, conduct another survey and try to uh, just, uh, uh, have another follow up questions some other follow up questions. Um, I'm not really sure if the media intentionally withhold the kind of information about negative consequences because when we talk about some politicians and some uh, conservative media talk about. South Korea, the need for South Korea to develop nuclear weapons, they mostly sort of support that, that they don't necessarily talk about negative consequences. But I think that some liberals and progressives talk about some um, negative consequences and that they are, that they are against the idea of going nuclear. Um, but the idea of Washington in the you know, public, publicly uh, talk, explaining the potential consequences that's just not a very nice thing to do as an ally, right? And so I don't think the Washington, Washington did, Washington does that, but, but people understand that there will be some consequences. Um, yeah, but thank you. Sarah, or, yeah, or, or let's hear the French. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions. One is about public opinion, yeah, creation. What is public opinion? <laughs> Um, you mentioned that nine percent of the people supported U.S. nukes in South Korea. The Department of U.S. You, can sorry, sorry. you said that only nine percent of uh, South Korean people supported U.S. nukes. Mm -hmm. I thought this number was very low, and I'm interested if you have any explanation for that or a hypothesis as to why that's so. 
And the second question is that you didn't mention the possibility of the stability instability paradox that could kick in if South Korea acquires nuclear weapon, the US pulls out, and you have North and South Korea with nuclear bombs. But it's something that is considered by experts in South Korea. It's something you have an opinion on how it would play out. And um, I forgot my third question. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, I did not know that I write it down. If it comes back later, I'll ask you. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So the nine, only 9% percent uh, for uh, supported the U.S.'s tactical nuclear weapons. Um, well, so well, I don't have a strong answer to that. I mean, and then that is another uh, question that I think that we should um, examine more deeply in our follow-up uh, survey. Uh, but I mean, you know, we were a little bit concerned about asking this question because, like. Do people really understand what tactical nuclear weapons uh, really are? Um, but we still wanted to ask this question because that's what a lot of politicians are talking about. But if I have to guess, this is just my speculation, um, but I think that um, South Koreans are just, um, they want to have their own weapons. And, and so because even if the United States has nuclear weapons, well, this is based on the assumption that people understand what tactical nuclear weapons mean. Um, but even if the US uh, deploys tactical nuclear weapons, uh, still South Korea doesn't have the authority to use them. And if it's just still, I think that, you know, that's the, in the realm of extended deterrence, just that the only difference is that nuclear weapons are closer or uh, in Korea. So, so still, I, I think South Koreans want autonomy and their own capabilities. Um, I haven't really heard anybody talking about the stability and stability uh, 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 question among experts, and so I cannot really answer it. But sorry, very good question, though. Sir, did you want to? No, my question also actually was sort of dovetailing on, on uh, what Pama just asked about the stability and stability paradox. So I'll be curious to hear what uh, what answer you yeah. Very positive. So I enjoyed your talk, um, and uh, I found your your theoretical policy implications to be slightly orthogonal to your argument, because as far as I can tell, you basically think the argument for South Korea having its own nuclear weapons is actually quite strong. And as far as I can tell, the South Korean public also thinks the argument is quite strong. And I think almost any nuclear deterrence theorist in the abstract would say that the argument is quite strong. There are no technical obstacles in South Korea to prevent them from being a nuclear weapon state. Um, so my question is, what is it about the South Korean establishment that makes them willing to continue this dependency relationship with the United States, which actually puts their country at risk. Right? So there's some factor X that's dispositive here that seems to me either be outside the argument or it's in another argument, but I'm having trouble sort of guessing what it is. I think I know what it is, but I wonder what you say yeah, so your question is basically then why South Korea uh, doesn't pursue nuclear weapons, but it, according to my you argument. Made a very strong argument. Most of your talk made a strong argument for why they should. The reasons you advanced for why they shouldn't are weak, with one exception, and it's the relationship with the U.S. Yeah, and because the costs are just really high, because yeah. the costs would be too high. No, they wouldn't. The cost, is, the cost is the relationship with the U.S. Is that cost higher than being dependent so, on the U.S. at the risk of the North, or is it not? So I don't think that the uh, relationship with the United States is the only reason. I think that economic factor is, is an also very big uh, reason uh, because if, I mean, South Koreans say that they support nuclear weapons, but if we start talking about like really tangible economic consequences, I don't really think that they will support nuclear uh, armament. What are economic consequences? The, the, you think you think it's really possible to sustain a, a global sanctions regime against South Korea over nuclear weapons choices? It's not possible. Well, right? so and yeah, nuclear weapons, nuclear nuclear weapons are basically cheap. They're, they're, I don't see what the cost structure. Is. Well, I think that you know when uh, the United States deployed. Um, the that missile defense system on South Korean soil uh, back in 2016 and 17. 
uh, China imposed sanctions against South, Korea, South Korean businesses and the tourism industry. That led to a decrease in South Korea's uh, GDP by 0.4 percent. I mean, that was a you know, in comparison to South Korea's nuclear armament, that is a such a you know, like much benign situation for China. But so China, so China's sanctions alone would be very costly. But also, economic international sanctions. I'm not really sure if there will be no economic sanctions at the part, on the part of the international community if South Korea suddenly builds nuclear weapons. You're not convincing. <laughs> I, I'm well, not convinced that these costs drive the decision of the South Korean establishment. It seems to me that your argument will be stronger if you actually try to weigh the main consequence against the main benefit. And the main consequence is tense relations with the United States. That's the main consequence. I think part of the argument here, can you give us some examples of where the South Korea establishment has really gone against the United States? Or is the South Korea establishment simply this wants to be in lockstep with the United States and nuclear issues are, are first and foremost among us? Uh, so if so, uh, there are, uh, uh, there are, have been any cases where South Korean establishments went against the United States, yes. yeah, especially yeah, especially the liberals and progressives in South Korea do not really. They are, I mean, th they tend to be more sort of nationalistic and then like they want to have more autonomy. And so, I mean, there have been some cases in, for example, uh, uh, like some uh, like free trade agreement. There have been some um, conflicts between the two countries and. Um, but, but South Korea relies on the U.S. for security guarantee today, right? Well, if South Korea had nuclear latency, which it doesn't, but it's trying to have that, um, then going nuclear will, will, will be really, really quickly. I mean, South Korea can go nuclear really quickly. In that situation, I think South Korea may be able to withhold, you know, withstand this, you know, sanctions, potential sanctions and, you know, damage to the U.S.-South Korea alliance. However, so that, that is a Japan case, right? Japan can build nuclear weapons overnight because it, it can, you know, it has nuclear fissile materials. But when it, so that's what South Korea wants, in, in my opinion. However, um, if South Korea tries to build nuclear weapons today, then what well, I asked Matthew Bond, um, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Matthew Bond at the Belfast Center, because he knows technical stuff, uh, you know, how long it would take South Korea to build nuclear weapons if it starts today? And then he says three to five years. Why? Because South Korea doesn't have the capability or facilities to build nucle nuclear uh, fissile materials. That takes time. And so, you know, if it is a Japan kind of situation where South Korea can just hang tight for like three months, six months, maybe South Korea will be be able to do that. But if South Korea will have to, you know, withstand this pressure and sanction and everything for three to five years, that will be too costly. So my argument is South Korea wants to get to the point where it can build nuclear weapons and then it can, you know, um, narrow the window of vulnerability so that you can just present that option as a fait accompli. So, okay, we have them, what, what do you want to do? What, what are you going to do? <laughs> Okay, well, responding to that, first of all, South Korea has a very large reactor program, and it can implement its reprocessing program, which Matthew Bunn was talking about, under the guise of reprocessing fuel for use in their reactors. It's not really economically a viable option, but it's close. So they can do that and they can avoid sanctions until they get to the end of the cycle. So it, we're not talking three to five years, we're talking less than one year. Then the 20% restriction on their enrichment is no problem at all anymore. That's enough for all their reactors and they don't need high enriched uranium for nuclear warheads. They can rely on plutonium. So the combination of those two means they can have a short window of vulnerability. So South Korea doesn't have reprocessing capability. I mean, Japan does, South Korea doesn't. That's right, but it would take them three to five years to build it. And they would build it under the guise of this. Oh, yeah, but that's program. not allowed under the one to three agreement. And so so the, under the one to three agreement, so you mentioned the 20% enrichment. So what the revised agreement said is that 
United uh, South Korea can enrich uranium up to to up to twenty percent with the U.S.'s consent, but still South Korea needs to get the U.S.'s consent, and the, the U United States is not giving South Korea the consent, and so just really. Um, so, so they have been. So that's my argument. South Korea is trying to convince the United States, persuade the United States to give that consent to South to South Korea in order to have the the, the latent capability. But it, it's not possible uh, today. Do you think if they broke some of those rules, it would trigger international sanctions under the guise of a nuclear power program? Well, at that point, so uh, well, so that will uh, be questionable. Uh, Theoretically, very legally speaking, um, this one to three agreement says that South Korea cannot enrich or reprocess U.S. origin materials. And so theoretically, if South Korea gets enrichment from I mean, uranium from another country and enrich it in South Korea, that's not going to be a violation, a, a violation of this one to three agreement. Um, however, that's going to be a very big, uh, that's going to cause big damage to the alliance and the U.S. The South Korea's relationship with the United States, and so that's almost like a nuclear option. And so, um, yeah, that has been the from doing that. Chicago. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your talk very much. I'm Chicago Wiki, I'm a visiting scholar here for the year. I'm uh, usually more on, on other years. I'm a professor at Waseda University in Tokyo. Um, so Japan has a similar problem, which is the unsure whether U.S. will actually um, ex extend the nuclear umbrella. So this has been the case, and, and Japan has kept its what you call latent uh, nuclear capability. Um, but it's not building anything, although independently, the technologies are advancing. There are no concerted effort to actually so um, I think the biggest concern that probably South Korea and Japan have is about U.S., right? But it's not just the U.S., it's the North Korean capability, but more importantly, probably Chinese capabilities. And uh, so the big question is, can they be deterred? Can North Korea and China be deterred uh, from using nuclear weapons against South Korea? and against Japan. So you have several moving parts. And in one of my students did a study on Japan's nuclear latency, and, and the findings was that it was more to negotiate with US, less about deterring. And if you think, because US has been you know, basically saying that we're going to defend no matter what kind of assurance, and if that verbal assurance plus the 5,000 nuclear warhead is not going to deter North Korea or China. It's a little bit Pollyannish to think that few nuclear weapons of your own would actually do the job, right? <laughs> so it's really about, you know, how trying to, maybe it's more to do with trying to negotiate with US, even in South Korean case. And one of the things that you didn't touch upon is the uh, wartime command. Would these things actually reassure South Korea more? And the big question is, if South Korea wanted to develop nuclear weapons, is it really in, not in US interest to let South Korea do that? If it's within the alliance, is that so bad? <laughs> and I, I agree with uh, Barry's argument. I think tourists not coming to South Korea would be a really, really small issue compared with a situation where you have very little credibility alliance as a whole. If you cannot you know, think about nuclear deterrence, how are you going to be so sure about conventional deterrence as well? So, so I think the economic cost argument is extremely weak. Not today, but in a situation where South Korea actually does decide and wants to go nuclear. Yeah, there are several questions. So, you know, just regarding the first point that you made, uh, yeah, you said the thousand, I mean, like if the U.S. Is, uh, alliance with the United States and thousands of U.S. Uh, uh, nuclear weapons cannot deter North 
Korea, from a techie South Korea, if, if or Japan. Uh, will South Korea's a new Japan, Japan's like a few nuclear weapons will be able to deter North Korea or China? So some would argue that they will be happy to have their own nuclear weapons if it is just a handful than relying on other countries' nuclear weapons. That depends. That depends on the faith that you have in the credit, um, the extended deterrence and your allies' security guarantee. I mean, this question has been uh, addressed just pretty much since the, the development of nuclear weapons, and different people have different thoughts on this. But ultimately, security establishment would never really be hundred percent sure um, that they will. Uh, they can rely on another country because, I mean, the president of the United States is his or her main responsibility is to protect his or her, her, her own people. Uh, and so, you know, um, it's, it's questionable, but, you know, defense people, they want to have more certainty about, like, uh, you know, their ability to defend themselves. And so, so, so that depends on how you view uh, the credibility of extended deterrence. Uh, another question about um, international sanctions, and uh, Posa, you also mentioned that. But I want to ask you the question. I mean, this is also, uh, you know, uh, about projection. Uh, will the international community and the United States and China uh, be okay with South Korea's nuclear weapons development? I mean, uh, yeah, of course, everybody understands that South Korea is facing a nuclear threat, uh, but if letting uh, if letting South Korea have nuclear weapons without any consequences, you know that's going to affect the global non-nuclear nuclear proliferation norms uh, quite significantly. And so, if you have uh, thoughts, I, I would I would be really, uh, happy to hear. It seems like the United States is hell bent on a containment policy in Asia. So in the midst of a containment policy in Asia, we're going to have a feud with one of our principal allies that says it needs nuclear weapons in the same way the French have nuclear weapons, or the Indians have nuclear weapons, or the Russians have nuclear weapons. I think we would definitely try and stop it because we have our own view of these things. And our view is that if we're going to defend a country, then we're going to manage the nuclear crises from Washington. We're not going to have two two decision centers managing a nuclear crisis. I think that's always been the basic American bias. Right? I don't think if North Korea, a, a, a liberal democratic capitalist country within its own political system makes a decision to have to withdraw from the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and get nuclear weapons, the United States is going to go to economic war with South Korea? I don't think it is. Now, it might reconsider the alliance. Right? It might reconsider the alliance, but look at the other nuclear powers, independent nuclear powers, with which we have alliances. So what would actually be the liberal argument? Right? What would be the liberal coalitional argument as to why a liberal democratic member of our coalition can't have its own autonomous nuclear weapons capability? For that matter, Israel has its own nuclear weapons capability. Right? Now, I can see why South Korean politicians wouldn't want to go through all this Sturm and Drang. But I think if you explore it, it's the answers you give are not so cut and dry. Right? You, you, you provide answers that are kind of cut and dry. To, oh, you wouldn't do this because of that cost. You wouldn't do this because of that cost. Well, a lot of those costs don't really seem that, that, that important to me relative to the national security problem that the North faces, which you outlined extremely well. Right? That they have a nuclear adversary to the north who's getting better, a nuclear adversary that can reach out to the United States to make our our commitment much costlier than it was. Right? And if truth be told, China is some sort of a problem in its own right. So South Korea lives in a tough neighborhood, right? And their conventional spending shows that they understand they live in a tough neighborhood, right? This argument shows that they know they live in a tough neighborhood. The latency they're trying to get shows that they know they live in a tough neighborhood. And they're willing to do all kinds of things and pay all kinds of costs to do it. But they won't pay the biggest cost, which is the, the political process of making this happen and the effects of that political process on the alliance with the United States. They just don't want to find out what it's like. It's my suspicion. I don't know. I'd love to see what their polling shows. And, you know, experiments with people in the South Korean establishment, but 
the way you lay out the case, you know, it seems to me the facts of the case point ineluctably to a very strong South Korean motivation to have an independent nuclear deterrent, and they have all the capabilities for doing so, right? So if they don't do it, what's the reason? I don't think if you, know, you want to array the costs, I think you want to be pretty serious about assessing those costs. Really pick away at them and say, well, these are the costs that a non-proliferation person would make or somebody else would make. But let's rank these costs and try and zero in on what the main perceived cost is that the North, the South Korean establishment wrestles with every time they come up with this program. That, that's, I think, would strengthen your presentation a lot. That's, that's why you ask me my... I don't usually do this, but you asked me my opinion, so I should. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate it very much. I mean, this is this project is still in the early stage, um, you know, early stage, and so, uh, and I will um, uh, go to Korea and do more research and perhaps experiment or uh, survey another survey. But um, I, I appreciate it very much. However, really, when Israel, France, some other and some other countries or India uh, developed nuclear weapons, that was a different time. That was before the nuclear suppliers group, before you know the the really the sort of the global nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear non-proliferation norms became really mature. And uh, of course, now South Korea faces a bigger threat. And um, but. Uh, so uh, yeah, this this is a question that I'm. So in the past, like several years ago, I thought that okay, these costs were really just very clear. I mean, I I, I didn't have any doubts. But I do also think that here that increasingly more American people say that well, we should you know South Korea's nuclear going nuclear is an inevit inevitability. We may have to live with it. However, well, if I talk to government people, government officials, the policymakers, uh, of course, they may have to say that a nuclear South Korea is just not acceptable, but they are very clear on this issue. And so, yeah, I will look into that, but thank you very much. Just very briefly to add, I think it will be interesting to see whether that the, um, going nuclear is coupled with uh, an element or accepting the withdrawal of the U.S. or the element of the alliance, whether they you know, they're, they're too, uh, maybe it could be very optimistically hoping that you, South Korea would get its own nuclear weapons, but still somehow get to keep the alliance, because those are extremely different things, right? So it's the real cost is not to have the alliance. So it will be interesting to see whether people or the establishment actually think of it as we need the nuclear weapons, even if we lose the alliance. Huh. Yeah, but again, though, Again, it will take South Korea some time to build a workable nuclear arsenal without emerging from processing. And so, you know, during that period, South Korea will not have, I mean, we'll have to see. But if, if South Korea loses an alliance without having nuclear weapons yet, that is the critical vulnerability that South Korea has to seriously worry about. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I had Eric and Charlie, uh, do one of you have a question that really picks up on this thread or a, a new direction you want to go? Yeah, I had a comment. That, okay, go ahead. Because you asked about the economic the cost. Just to, to add to what Barry said, on the Chinese side, I, I would be hesitant to offer sort of a definitive prediction, but nevertheless, we have several cases of Chinese uh, use of economic statecraft, and all of them avoid, you know, taking measures that will hurt, that will badly damage uh China's own industrial uh, potential. So, you know, in the Australia case, in the Thad case, tourism, uh, you know, shopping centers, uh, you know, some some commercial trade, farm goods, but not anything that involves investment, critical materials, other things. And so, I haven't seen any 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 indication that China would be willing to do that. And I think they're less willing to do it now and going forward than they would have been five years ago. So, growth now is at five percent, headed for three percent. You know, um, and Everybody's pulling out, not going in. So, so that, that was one thing. And then I just had a, a question, which is, uh, I'm I'm actually a little bit unsure on what your policy preference here is. So, it, if it if it is latency, it sounded a lot like latency at a minimum was a step towards getting a nuclear weapon. If if you wanted a nuclear weapon, is that is that is that what you're looking at? Yeah, so I, I am thinking more about this because I think, you know, we have to think about different scenarios in order to assess uh, which option would be the best. So if, 
the alternative of nuclear hedging is nuclear armament, then I think that acquiring nuclear arm, uh, latency is better. Because if South Korea doesn't have nuclear latency, then it will just go to nuclear weapons, go nuclear, just acquire nuclear weapons, then I think nuclear latency is better. I think actually ha trying to get nuclear weapons now is very risky um, because if North Korea would ever want to attack South Korea, then it will be when North Korea believes that South Korea will acquire nuclear weapons soon. So during this, you know, uh, period, then that will be the point that North Korea will try to attack South Korea. So, so I think for that reason also, it is uh, dangerous to go nuclear at this point. And so, in, in, so. So I am I am thinking more about this, and so in a way, I'm wondering if South, the United States should at least allow South Korea to acquire nuclear latency, if that will make South Korea feel better. But then the, the danger is that the South Korea can build nuclear weapons quickly afterwards, and so. Um, yeah, but it still, that's still better than South Korea acquiring nuclear weapons because the consequences will be very uh, uh, severe for uh, the security in the region and the, in, in the globe. And so I'm struggling with this uh, um, question myself now. Charles Glazer. I wanted to make a couple of comments on your argument, but then a different question. Um, I, know, I agree on the, on the cost of the So if you look at the India-Pakistan weaponization, there were sanctions, but they weren't very costly, and now India has been brought fully into the sort of revised regime, and I think the United States would be at least as understanding of South Korean proliferation. So I don't, I don't see the economic cost being large there. I was thinking that it would be maybe large from the China side, but Eric says they wouldn't be. So, um, but I think the sanctions would be not extremely costly. Um, I mean, and, and they might be, you never know, but the India example suggests otherwise. The India-Pakistan example suggests otherwise. Um, I also think the MPT norm, its impact is, is greatly exaggerated. Um, so there hasn't been a cascade generated by the, you know, each step of proliferation has not generated a huge cascade. Countries are mostly deciding if they need nuclear weapons be, um, and if they really need them for whatever reason, you know, right or wrong, they will, they proceeded to get them. And there's just very few potentially marked cases at the margin. Um, so anyway, so the, the norm isn't that strong. It's it's there, it's costly, but um, states have, you know, incurred those costs. Um, I don't think they would, it would be huge to the regime. Um, so I think those are, are you, you just do want to be careful with them. So I'm, I agree with you and I guess other, you, it probably would be the, the potential risk with respect to the United States. Um, and I think it would create huge havoc. But in the end, the United States wants South Korea as an ally. And I think it would keep it as an ally, nuclear or not. So there'd be, you know, some risk and like it would be very challenging period. Like there'd be a lot of anger and unhappiness because we've stopped many allies from getting nuclear weapons. We care about it. We've coerced our allies pretty you know, pretty severely, including Germany, Taiwan, South Korea, um, when they were pursuing weapons. But nevertheless, I think that it would work out. So it makes me wonder if, um, I mean, maybe the South Koreans are misjudging that, or maybe they're not as worried about extended deterrence as they say. Um, but that would be the, I mean, I think that's the way to square the circle. Um, one way or the other, those would be one of the two options for why South Korea isn't proceeding. Um, so I just put, um, I think those are in line sort of with what some other people have said, but I mean, I think it's, you know, on the other hand, you are rolling the dice. If I were South Korea, I would rather have the United States as an ally than have nuclear weapons without the United States. So if you think that's a possibility, then you should be very cautious. Um, my question is actually about the deterrent value of a latent program. Um, a lot of wars start pretty quickly. So I'm just wondering what wars are... Um, that what are the scenarios that, that you envision, since you're a latency proponent, um, that latency would be adequate to deter? Like, let's say it's a six-month window, which I think is a pretty quick conversion from not having missile material to having a weapon. Like, it won't happen that fast. But let's say it was six months. What wars wouldn't be resolved within six months and therefore would be deterred by the, the possibility? Yeah, to answer your question, for instance, 
yeah, I know that there are, are some, you know, papers that are out there that argue that the nuclear latency itself has a deterrent effect. I don't think so, for the reason that you just stated. Um, but, but unless you have nuclear weapons, nuclear latency itself is not going to deter an enemy from attacking you. However, it, it, it will just shorten the amount of time that you need if something happens. If you are, you, you get really nervous about a potential conflict and you can have, you can build nuclear weapons quickly. So that is the value, but it doesn't have the deterrent value, in my opinion. Um, but regarding sanctions and regarding some other causes, I could really appreciate your comments. But India and, India and Pakistan didn't join the NPT. They didn't violate the Non-Proliferation Treaty to develop nuclear weapons. But, you know, South Korea can legally get out really quickly. Yeah, that, that is true. However, you know, North Korea had, it was the only country that joined and, you know, um, the love the treaty, but that's North Korea. But if South Korea does that, I mean, South Korea, put, I mean, claims, and other countries also accept South Korea as a, you know, norm abiding, good, you know, member of the international community. And so I think if South Korea does that, the damage to the non-proliferation norm will be very significant. And also, it is true that India and Pakistan, now, especially, you know, India, uh, but also Pakistan are sort of accepted as nuclear weapon states, not officially under the non-proliferation treaty, but still the sanctions are mostly, you know, withdrawn. And then but also because of strategic importance of those countries. And I, I, I agree with that. However, Pakistan had to go through economic sanctions, you know, for, for, for a while. And I don't think that South Korea will be willing to, you know, um, face that kind of international sanctions for that a long period of time. I mean, Pakistan is said that we will build nuclear weapons even if we have to eat grass. I don't think that South Koreans would, would say that. And, and, and then also, South Koreans, if you talk to South Koreans, well, they are sort of inured to North Korean nuclear threats. I'm not saying that they don't feel concerned about nuclear threats. However, it happens just kind of gradually and then, you know, things are just normal and people don't really think about North Korea's nuclear weapons on a day-to-day uh, uh, basis. And so, when it comes to you know cost benefit analysis, and then in terms of the cost of nuclear, but I'm not sad on this. I'm, I'm going to delve, delve into this, uh, and I, I am also thinking about this. But I think at this point, what I think is that the costs are really high when it, uh, the cost of nuclear weapons, but the uh, benefits are uh, potentially huge. But a lot of people think that still. Um, North, it's very unlikely that North Korea will attack South Korea because. Um, of course, I mean, you know, there's a threat and people are concerned about it and the security establishment want to have the ability to defend itself. However, because of North Korea's inferior nuclear conventional capabilities and because it's a small country, if North Korea attacks South Korea in order to, uh, with nuclear weapons in order to unify the country, that's just not going to happen. I mean, this is going to be radiologically contaminated. What are you going to do with this territory that is radiologically contaminated? And so still people think that the chance is pretty low. So, yeah. Jonathan Caverly. Well, just to say, I mean, so if you want to make that argument, then you're actually making the argument that extended that they don't need nuclear weapons very much which is fine but it's a little bit different than the way that you presented it so if you want to you know so if if the need is smaller for those reasons then maybe hedging looks relatively better and getting getting nuclear weapons looks relatively worse but that's not this i mean i think it's a different spin so you're not i don't mean to say i have tried never both ways but to reach that bottom, you've got. It would be good to decide which of those two present, you know, views of the need you think is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that it's not like a, you know, sort of on a spectrum, right? I mean, you know, like of course, South Korea, there is a demand for nuclear weapons, but then how much cost are you going to really be willing to 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 bear, right? And so that that's where you know the demand, how much is, how strong the demand is, and I think it is strong enough to pursue nuclear hedging for now, um, but not enough to develop nuclear weapons right now because of the cost benefit balance. But yeah, but but that's a very good point. Thank you. So um, on Barry's point, at least in the short term, why? Korean elites are so attached to the United States. I think there's a military reason as well as an economic reason, and probably a stronger one. I just don't think right now the Korean leadership and Eric and you can disabuse me of this are particularly comfortable fighting 
a war or trying to deter a war without significant American conventional capabilities um, that exist right now. Now, South Korea is trying to build its own capabilities, almost much more so than its nuclear cap latency. Um, and maybe one day it'll assess that the United States is now deterred from intervening conventionally by, uh, by North Korean nuclear capability. But until that time, that is a cost that has to be factored in whether this capability will be available to them during conflict. Um, whether Eric's right or not about Chinese reactions, it's certainly something that has to go into the project, right? You have to talk about what China's reaction this is like one of the few things that China and the United States might actually agree on, at least for the next few years, right? And then the question I had for you is, is the fact that Japan will get there first because it already has nuclear latency in terms of developing nuclear capability. Is that something that is factored into South Korean calculus? Yeah, so definitely, especially when it comes to Japan, South Korea is very sensitive uh, that uh, Japan has the same capability with South Korea does it, and also uh, the United States sort of allowed Japan to keep this uh, technology, uh, whereas uh, South Korea is not allowed to develop this technology. And so, so yeah, that's definitely a factor. And also, um, I mean, South Korea, surprisingly, South Korea considers Japan as a military threat still. Um, I was pretty shocked to hear recently um, uh, that um, a South Korean um, military officer saying that, uh, you know, when I, I was asking, like, South Korea's intermediate range missiles that go beyond the Korean Peninsula, that's potentially uh, aimed at countering China's threats. And then actually that person, I don't know if he's right or wrong, but that person said it's more to deter, I mean, to counter Japan's threats. And so that was pretty shocking to me. But uh, yeah, so I think Japan is a definitely a factor. You want to go ahead? Piggybacking on Charlie, is it, is it possible that um, latency per se doesn't contribute that much to it? deterrence problem, but the deeper source of latency is concern about the American future and in the, in, in the, in the future of the American commitment. So the, the more you doubted the future reliability of the Americans, the more latency you would want. The narrower the window between a decision and acquisition you would want. So if that's the hypothesis, you'd be looking for changes in the perceived reliability of the American commitment. And you might say that you know the election of Donald Trump was Exhibit A. Um, the, the the kind of change going on within the Republican foreign policy establishment concomitant to that is maybe exhibit B, right? Um, so that there are some things in the wind that might make a country doubtful about the future of the American commitment. If that country faced a nuclear adversary, I think you'd be buying all the insurance you could get within the constraints of not killing off the relationship before it dies naturally <laughs> with the United States. So what about that idea? Um, yeah, so the especially uh, the doubt on doubts about American extent of the security guarantee enhances the desire for nuclear latency. Might be fine now, but it's the future that you're ensuring. Mm. Yeah, that's... Uh, against the future, against trends, against draws in the wind. It is after all your national security, so all national security planning... Is about low probability, high cost events. And one low probability or high cost event might be U.S. exit. And if that probability is changing just a little bit, that might be perceived as a significant problem. And you'd have good reason in the last 10 or 15 years to start wondering whether the Americans are going to be around forever. Yeah, yeah. And, that, um, and that doesn't just apply to the, uh, the uh, extended nuclear deterrent, but to the alliance as a whole. So yeah. I mean, we talked a lot about the, the potential impact of Korea going nuclear on the alliance, but we haven't really talked at all about the other conditions. So, I mean, what about North Korea's going nuclear and then getting more and more and more better nuclear in terms of that impact already, that sort of independent impact, among other things, you know, not to mention our own political maladies, but can, can the impact a, of that yeah. on the future of the alliance. Ken has a two finger, and then we'll go to Polina Belikova after that. Ken, do you want to? It's really building um, very 
Peter's remarks, but thinking about Japan for a second on latency. Uh, I had the great honor and privilege of getting drunk with a bunch of high-level Japanese members of the foreign policy elite during one of the many periods of Trump crisis and North Korean crisis. And in the midst of the evening, there was much quite specific discussion of the benefits of latency in exactly the terms that you're describing it, with debates over whether you harvest materials unaccounted for from the processing facilities and do it as quietly as possible to move to a screwdriver turn away, or whether you do it in ways that are more public in order to signal what is going on. But the points that you're making are, are very well taken. The potential for latency as an approach within Korea, within Japan, and, and other countries somewhat similarly situated um, is a very real possibility. Now, the presence of alcohol is not an accepted procedure <laughs> with MIT Human Subjects Committees, and I'm not reporting this as research. I don't know how reliable the information I obtained was, but I do want to say that I thought people were quite serious in that discussion. Polina, yeah, can you stand up so we can see you? Yeah, sure. Just following up on that, I think IRB does not like people are drunk during expert interviews. So if they're not human subjects, you can do that. Um, so, um, my question, so my perception of the entire security architecture that you described to us is that it depends on timely and accurate threat assessment. And so with the strategic utility of latency will depend on what kind of war we're fighting or expecting. So I'm very curious about the politics of threat assessment in South Korea. Specifically, my understanding is that South Korea relies a lot on signal intelligence. So what are the agencies and actors that are in charge of interpreting these signals? Is there any redundancy in their responsibilities? And is there any competition between them? And of course, whether it creates the windows for failure. Yeah, well, the signal interpretations, of course, South Korea has many different uh, intelligence agencies like analysis, and they don't communicate with one another. And I'm sure there's a lot of competition going on. But this, I this, I haven't found anything that is in, in the unclassified setting about South Korea's signal interpretations uh, capabilities, really. So, yeah, sorry about that. You know, the reason why I'm asking is that after a recent Israeli intelligence failure, we have to take these issues very seriously, and we're talking nuclear weapons here. So that, that's the only reason why I'm asking this question in the context of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll look into that, but I, I doubt that I find, I will find anything unclassified, but yeah. I'm going to use my privilege to ask the last question. Some of us can ask more questions but um, I was talking last night at our nuclear age dinner with one of our graduate students, Nicholas Planchette, who's saying that the, the psychological cultural meaning of nuclear weapons is much different between the French and the British. And I noticed in one of your slides, you said that 26% of North South Koreans said it would increase the prestige of South Korea to have nuclear weapons. And I'm also, you know, one of the things we have this idea about soft power and hard power, and I think you mentioned the soft power. You know, at SSP, we're real hard power people. We like to talk about deterrence by denial and punishment and all these kinds of things. But, you know, up the, up the road, Harvard, they like to talk about soft power. Mm -hmm. um, but South Korea, as far as like soft power, they're, they're punch way below above their weight i mean all the they win academy awards they have k-pop they're and isn't that enough prestige and soft power do you need the hard power too or you might think we're, we're so powerful now in soft power that we should have hard power to match our 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 soft power but what is is can you say something about the psychological meaning of like hey we are we're not dominated by Japan anymore. We do not have to be intimidated, so we should have nuclear weapons. That's a sign of our status as a country. Is that part of what's going on here or, or not? 
So yeah, my colleagues and I also found it really surprising when we saw like twenty six percent, you know, um, uh, one nuclear weapons because of precision and what does prestige mean to them? I am very curious about that myself. And so because, you know, when the French develop nuclear weapons, that getting nuclear weapons is a you know, sign of sim, uh, symbol of power and all that. Um, but, I mean, today, recently, the nuclear aspirants like North Korea and, and Iran, you know, they... It, they they were just international pariahs, and so we we I, I am um, thinking about looking more into this. Um, but my guess is that you know South Koreans feel that they are sandwiched between two superpowers once again. This time, the United States and China, and it's just being punched around. And so I think maybe the prestige to them means like autonomy. Um, but um, I'm I'm. Like I'm, I'm gonna interview some people and try to figure out what they really mean by prestige. All right, so we're out of time. So let's uh, thank our speaker. Thank you.